came to the conclusion that if I continued to live in New York, I was going to end up writing about 3,000 pages less than I should write by the time I died, assuming that I would live to a ripe old age. And the side of the time had come either to uh, enjoy life or become a writer, uh, a most painful decision. And as you can see, because I've bought a house here, I obviously believe that uh, it's more important to, to become a writer than to enjoy life. So I'm making my sacrifice <laughs> for it all. But uh, it, no, it, to, to be just a touch less facetious about it, the, the reason I came to uh, Provincetown is that it's the only town I know in America that has any connotation for me. In other words, the only town I could ever think of as being my town, a town I might have grown up in, uh, a, a town I might have been born in. I've been coming here for 20 years. And uh, I think it's one of the few towns in America that possesses any uh, natural beauty. And the, uh, as we have many, many beautiful small towns in America. But this one uh, has a, a beauty which is uh, not a privileged beauty or a, uh, it, it's rather a natural beauty, a casual beauty, it, 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 uh, even a tawdry beauty. It, 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 many of the, it, it, it has a, moment, this is a town which has a terrible reputation. It's a, a hunky tonk in summer. Uh, my favorite name for it is, is the wild west of the east. It's a wild place in the summer. In the winter, it's a cold, lonely, forbidden place with very few people in it and just fishermen. But it's, it's a town which has an extraordinary character, which is, which is, is as hard as the elements bleak, strong, filled with contrast, uh, so that you can live in a small town and work in a small town, and at the same time feel that you're in touch with something fairly elemental, something that would be equivalent to Hardy's Moors. As I started the neg in the day, I wrote the first 200 pages here. I worked on an American dream up here a great deal. And I wrote parts of, uh, I started the Deer Park here. I worked on Barbary Shore here. As a matter of fact, I think, I don't think there's a book I've worked on that I haven't worked on up here. I mean, every book I've published has, has had some work done up here. I finished the presidential papers here. It's a town that I just, uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine uh, really uh, coming to live in any other town than this. <laughs> hey, you can mention me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here. Hey, here we go. Oh. <laughs> Oh, here. Oh, back you go to your mother. <laughs> oh, thank you. Please, you see, it's known that the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, but what's not known is they landed in Provincetown three months before, and they found this place so uninhabitable and so barren and so gloomy that they left. It's very characteristic of my country that we would have a motel built at the place where the pilgrims landed. What's fitting about it is, is that the uh, corporation now inhabits the place where the pilgrims landed, which makes half of America very happy. One reason we have so many signs in America is that without a sign, it's very often it's very difficult to tell uh, what purpose a building is serving. This building is, of course, a motel, because I've told you it is, but um, it's, it belongs to a species of architecture which I call hospital modern. Its only competitors are airport modern. Some motels look like airports, some look like hospitals, some look like schools. Of course, all our schools look like factories, and our factories look like prisons or hospitals. The only thing that's good that one way you say about this is that some of our prisons look like colleges. What do you think about the, uh, the place of the American car in, in American culture? Uh, <laughs> you're a funny man. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, uh, I believe that uh, that is speaking a very Germanic style, that the uh, secrets of being are contained in form. And so there's no use complaining about the vulgarity of the American car. If the American car is vulgar, and indeed it is, then America as a nation is profoundly vulgar, with all the large meanings of vulgar, not the small meanings. To it, brutal, offensive, anomalous, stupid, obese. You think there are any good Smelly. <laughs> Do you think there are any good qualities in the American car as it, as it applies to society? Uh, yes, there's one good quality, which is it wears out fast, and so it keeps the economy running and uh, moving at a great rate, because people have to buy a car and then buy a new one every two years, since the old one has uh, become dangerous and difficult and impossible. But I just bought an American car, so I better not talk about that badly, or I will uh, spook myself. What about the car? You know, you, you curse American commodities at your peril. Yeah, I, I uh, if you've cursed an American commodity that you own, it ends up uh, revenging itself upon you. It, uh, the witches in America are, all belong to the corporations now. Mm, what do you mean by that? What <laughs> <laughs> uh, certain remarks have to explain themselves <laughs> by their existence.
Mm, that's what it means to be an existentialist. <laughs> The 20th century is the century in which man finally uh, threw away his restraints. You see, the 20th century is the century in which man said, uh, the hell with caution. We've got one thing that finally is working for us. We've got science. Science is working for us. We are making enormous strides with science, and so we will not worry about the results of this. We are going to follow science. Science will become our god. So the result is that all of mankind now is an extraordinary scientific race of every sort. And what's happened is that uh, man has always had, uh, let's say, he's always had possessed more power than morality. But the distance between the two has had, up to now in history, has had a fairly interesting tension. By now, it, there's no tension at all. The distance between science and morality by now is almost, um, uh, 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 let's say, it's almost uh, beyond our vision. And, and the result is that uh, we all live in profound kind of terror, because we have no idea at all whether we're going to um, become uh, uh, whether mankind is going to become a, a great creation or whether none of us are going to exist in even two years, five years, 20 years, or two months. I mean, name it. It's almost impossible to say. And so it's, I also think it's possible that man lives in an anxiety today that he's never lived in before. In other words, the experience of all of us is becoming different than any kind of experience we've ever known. Uh, I, I think, if you will, that the totalitarian spirit is winning. I don't mean necessarily that I think it's going to win, but I think if, if we were to... to, to since all Americans love sports contests, if we were to score this as a ball game, I, I would say that, the, yes, the totalitarians are unfortunately ahead. I think the, the, the great hope that, that, that exists uh, in fighting totalitarianism is that totalitarianism may have used up many of its advantages already, and some of the disadvantages are beginning to come in. You see, for instance, when a city has bad air, uh, in my mind, that has a great deal to do with totalitarianism. Totalitarianism, after all, is, 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 is the uh, abstract equivalent of piggishness. Uh, and it's something in the very piggishness of things that makes a city uh, to spoil its own air, poison its own water, violate its own food. You see, that can't go on for too long. About the time people begin to die uh, for totalitarianism, they're going to start opposing it. Nazism, after all, was a half totalitarianism. Uh, communism, to the extent that you can call it a uh, totalitarianism, is a half totalitarianism. We need to pure totalitarianism, the totalitarianism of, of uh, absolute oppression, the name of uh, something abstract. In other words, being uh, slavishly obedient to something you do not understand. About that time, uh, the one thing that will happen is that no one will be willing to die for totalitarianism. They'll be willing to be subservient to it, but they won't be willing to die for it. About the time they realize that it's killing them, they're going to start resisting it. So I think the hope is there, but the feeling I have is that things are going to get better uh, only after they've gotten considerably worse. The American public figure lives in, uh, I, I use this phrase once in one of my books, he lives in an electronic landscape. And so it isn't that he uh, goes looking for experience, it's that, in a way, the only real experience he can ever have is the unexpected experience, the startling experience. You, you know, Humphrey Bogart, for instance, once ate some glass on a bed. The reason they do these sort of things is not because they, they are go, they're looking for experience or because they wish to create a legend about themselves, I believe. I think they do it because it's the only way they can get experience that is their own experience. That is authentic experience. And I think the thing that's interesting about it is I think that this is, in a way, is seeping down into the mass of Americans. We're living in such an artificial environment by now, in such a false society, in such a plastic world, uh, a world of unnatural surfaces, that experience is becoming more and more uh, alienated from the traditions of the past. And so you have, uh, you, have, uh, you have all sorts of political examples of this. For example, uh, uh, you have America, which is a conservative, property-loving nation, going around destroying the property of people they've never even seen, you know, like the North Vietnamese. And, you know, America has this psychotic relation to reality by now. I mean, I think it's an insane country in the operated definition of psychotic, which is not attached to the real. This odd new kind of, uh, of search for experience that the public figure has is beginning to be characteristic of, of uh, the adolescence of America. Because I think they're looking for, um, they go s searching for experience precisely because it's the nature of modern life to destroy the possibility of encountering an experience. You see, our lives are filled with nothing but orientations, uh, expositions, uh, uh, programmatic uh, ventures. And, and, and so it, 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 it is almost a primitive instinct in man to go searching for an experience which will be his own. Well, the search for hallucinatory experiences, I think, are just a uh, direct religious uh, desire. In other words, once people have had a religious emotion, it's so, it's so powerful and so compelling that they go searching for it again. I'm very opposed to LSD. I think it's a very bad thing. I'm sure it is. But I've learned one thing out of living 43 years is that you can't get something for nothing out of life. You, 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 you pay for every single uh, uh, good experience that you, that you have. It's, it's, it's the meaning of life. I mean, life would be intolerable if, if you didn't have to pay 
for everything uh, that occurs to you that's at all deep or, or has any beauty to it. And so to, to, to have these experiences without having gone through the physical and mental and spiritual discipline, and to, to have a profound religious experience without having, uh, to, so to speak, paid one's dues, must, I think, perform some profound damage. I mean, if one has a soul and the soul has any continuance in a hereafter, one must damage the continuance of one's soul by, by getting a, 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 a cheap or an artificial or chemical glimpse of eternity. And, uh, but I think that the reason is, is precisely because, because, because people have to have, uh, it's getting to the point where, where a man is living in such an over-scientific environment that he has to have religious emotions or he's going to, to die, uh, die before he's dead. Hemingway's vision of life, which was extraordinarily personal, I, is, I think, has, has begun to spread. It, it, it uh, uh, spreads not the word, but I, I think that um, well, there was one man who had that attitude. There must be uh, several hundred thousand people in America by now, you know, men, young men between, let's say, uh, 15 and 30, who uh, would, would be, without even thinking of it, but must uh, subscribe to Hemingway's uh, philosophy in every detail. Mm -hmm. You see, they, they would believe that uh, what, the, the first point of the philosophy being that uh, what makes me feel good is good. What about you? I subscribe to it, but I, not not wholly. It's too difficult. It's it's impossible to live with it. So I think it, I think it, put it this way that if you're if I were 20 today, I might feel that way. But to if I were to if I'm to live with danger every minute, I'll never write a, any anything at all. And so for that reason, uh, I've had to make my uh, peace with that. Besides which, I don't like danger <laughs> that much. <laughs> I find it's marvelous when I'm through it, but the uh, the the the. Uh, confrontation with it is, is, is less agreeable than the aftermath. Because some of these kids are perfectly capable of uh, working for the corporation, making a fortune. They laugh at it, but for that reason, they could even, let's say, have less of a... Uh, uh, people who used to work for the corporation, let's say, used to have a, a, a rudimentary moral conscience. But with these kids, it's become such a joke, you see, that there might not be any uh, any conscience at all in pop art. The thing that characterizes all pop art, as far as I can see, all, all literary pop art and all dramatic pop art, is that there is absolutely no moral content whatsoever. I, I think that this, this new generation certainly uh, is, is directly attached to hedonism. I mean, it's, it's the one thing in life that they, they feel has any meaning. But they're, they're also, I think, very cautious about uh, being programmatic about it. I mean, they would never admit that they're interested in, in, uh, in, in hedonism. I mean, they would consider that a... Uh, 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 unbelievably uh, graceless uh, as an act, you know, you, you know to, to, to admit that they're interested in anything would, would, uh, would be uh, dubious. You know, nothing good could come of admitting interest. There is some sort of instinctive feeling that one has to return, that mankind has, has to return to some kind of primitive life, that, that we've, we've uh, uh, amputated ourselves of our, of our connection to the primitive. And so these are attempts to, to rediscover the primitive link. And one of the ways, one of the forms it takes is that people individually, I think this generation, looks for danger more than previous generations. I mean, the kids want the cars to be faster. Uh, they, they, there, there are sports that exist now that never existed before, like, for example, all, all the things that go on with, with underwater scuba uh, swimming, with, with parachute jumping, uh, with, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are going to be new sports discovered that are going to be fantastic and very dangerous. I think danger is one thing that uh, a lot of kids in this, this generation seek, and they seek it because it's... Um, it's the one medicine that uh, is, 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 is independent of the scientific world. The younger generations are, I mean, at least the one thing to be said for them is, is, is that they are absolutely rebellion against everything that uh, my generation and the generation before me has done. I think they're, they're, they're in that rebellion for good cause, which is, I think, that my generation has been a particularly uh, uh, stupid and impotent generation that accomplished nothing except to keep a, a ridiculous Cold War going on beyond its time. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the, the generation which I grew up in just has helped to wreck this country. The, the only thing in America that I think is, is really extraordinary and marvelous is, is our... Uh, our, our fierce sense of personal liberty. You know, because we, we, we've become the most conformist country in the West. I mean, it's, it's possible that, um, that we're almost as totalitarian, let's say, as the Soviet Union, in ways which are far more subtle than the Soviet Union and, and, and uh, far more difficult to, to, to delineate. But th there's no doubt about it. There's an enormous totalitarian process going on in America. At least there's no doubt in my mind that there is. 
And, and I think uh, the, the, the sort of disasters and uh, abortions that go on in Vietnam are an example of this. It's an example because like all totalitarian governments, we're incapable of uh, bearing a close, intimate and subtle relation to reality. <laughs> The troops home. End the war in Vietnam. Bring the troops home. The American patriots were afraid of against these creeps. We're all high on LSD. Junkies. Bring the troops home and bomb the north. Then bomb the village. The deepest tradition that we have is, is, is a tradition of political liberty and the ability to say what one thinks. And so we have this extraordinary phenomenon, which I think is absolutely uh, unlike anything that's ever occurred before in history, of a nation getting rapidly more totalitarian, at the same time having to pay the uh, absolute price of, 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 of uh, psychological, spiritual, and social indigestion of having complete political liberty at the same time as becoming totalitarian, which means that the issue is absolutely uh, up for grabs. In other words, I have no idea at all whether in five years this country will be... Uh, will be essentially a totalitarian country, or whether, on the contrary, the political liberties that, that this country cannot ignore and that cannot suppress, much as many people in this country would like to, uh, will succeed in carrying the day. In other words, whether, whether uh, uh, this country will be far less totalitarian in five or ten years, precisely because it, there's something in America that makes, it in, it makes, makes political leaders, political leaders can't even begin to contemplate the possibility of really shutting out uh, political opposition. Now, of course, they, they are able to blanket it in 10,000 ways, Man was, is going to end by becoming noble and, and glorious and fantastic and uh, creative and imaginative and beautiful. Or man is going to end as the slave of his own will and therefore will end in, in some form of totalitarianism. And I think that this is, that the, 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 if you will, that the agony of the 20th century is that precisely there's a titanic war going on between uh, the, those extraordinary and terribly complex forces which work toward totalitarianism and those equally complex and extraordinary forces which work toward uh, not necessarily toward liberty, because I don't like these words, but toward some sort of uh, creative elan, if you will, toward, toward something vital in the nature of things, toward, toward some, some almost inarticulate concept of, 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 uh, of, of beauty and justice and all the words that we've uh, almost ceased to believe in. He is looking for the heroic possibility more explicitly than almost anybody else. If you compare any uh, his anti-hero to... Saul Bellow's anti-hero, you see there's an enormous difference in the size of those characters. I mean, Norman Mailer really is trying to have something more than life-size. And, and there is no self-pity, there, no, there is no licking of the wounds in any uh, Mailer character. Whenever the writer is writing today, he's always writing a telegram. There's an urgency in everything we do. And later, before we were talking in the dunes, and you asked me why, uh, I've been writing essays. I, th I think it's because you write an essay when you feel what you have to say is so urgent that you can't wait to say it in a novel, and you can't say it through the, the aesthetic uh, filters of a novel, you, you know, with, with, the, with the ironies and the nuances of a novel. You have to say it head on. You have to say, look, this is what's going on, this is, and this is what has to be done. I don't think, uh, uh, from uh, a strictly intellectual point of view, his, uh, his critique of American society uh, uh, is a great one or a lasting one. <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, it rests on uh, on a uh, fairly uh, almost commonplace theoretical apparatus. But uh, what gives it its force and power is the weight of te personal testimony behind it. Uh, as to say, Mailer's uh, Mailer's personality and the the depth of his involvement in these issues and the, uh, the sense you get uh, that uh, the things he's talking about are a matter of life and death to him and possibly to us. The successes that will occur in the novel over the next 10 or 15 years will tend to be novels that are not quite novels, like Truman Capote's In Cold Blood or the first novel that come along which will have little records in it. You see, at a certain page, all of a sudden music starts and comes right out of the book. You see, and if it's done well, it'll be a remarkable book and so forth. But the classic novel, the novel where you just sit down on page one and read to page 1,000, and you say, my God, The Brothers Karamazov is a great novel. Uh, that novel is in danger of disappearing, but I would hate to see it disappear because I think that it's, that, that, that one thing to be said for the novel uh, as, as, a, uh, as a medicine 
apart from its other values, is that the novel is one of the few things around which can restore concentration. I still think of him as a traditional writer in some very strange way. I don't think many people would perhaps agree with that, but I do still think that way. His language, for instance, is, is very traditional. And, and the sense of pressure in his prose does not change that. It's a traditional uh, uh, style put under terrific strain by contemporaneity. What readers now demand is an extraordinary amount of expertise in the novelist. You see, you have to be right on your details. Well, of course, the particular ability that's involved in learning a set of details is all the other opposed to that ability uh, which uh, sparks the imagination to, to, to go in for greater and greater vaults and, 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 and leaps and, and bounds. And, and the result is that uh, it's very, very hard to write a novel which is profoundly imaginative at the same time as accurate in its details. The friend and the artist and the human being are one. If one increases in stature, the way that Norman sees it, I mean, there are some artists that are just interested in their expression and in the words or in the marble. There are others that feel that what they're doing is a whole of their lives. You know, one always wants more experience. I mean, there's certain people, and I'm one of them, who, who get greedy about experience, and they become pigs about it in a funny way. And I think I've come close to that condition now and again. But the, 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 the thing about uh, writing, finally, is, 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 is that, uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I need more experience now. I think what I, I need is, is, is more and more and more discipline. I like to become a pig about discipline, you know, to the point where uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to have 10 highly disciplined years in my life. Whether I will or not is not a matter. It's, it's the hardest thing in the world, discipline. I think that Norman takes and feeds from all the tradition he has and doesn't abandon it. He doesn't believe that one can start from now and go on. I think he keeps it all, but the now is desperately important, and the now is very difficult. Well, action with grace. I'm not interested in action for the sake of action. I mean, if I were interested in action for the sake of action, I would buy a bulldozer mm -hmm. and just uh, see uh, what I could smash, you know, how quickly I could smash it. You know, I was talking to a friend the other day, and we were talking about uh, conservatism. Mm -hmm. And finally, I gave him, I said, that I saw that I'm essentially a conservative. I'm a left conservative, uh, not a radical conservative, but a left conservative. And uh, we were talking about, what would you mean by that, you know? And I said, well, if you were to bring up five men and five trees and say, which do you save, the men or the trees? I would say, well, let me look at them. <laughs> I think that's a good uh, working, operative definition of conservatism. In other words, one has a profound respect for uh, the meaning of form, and so one studies the form of things very carefully. During the summer, we see each other quite a bit. We live, live near each other in Provincetown, and uh, we see each other probably on the average of once a week or so, or whenever there's a fight. Norman style, he's very aggressive. He moves to you, and the, uh, he comes on all the time. What's his best punch? Uh, I, I, would say, uh, I would say a left hook. He throws a nice left hook out of a crouch. He's the best uh, uh, writer, fighter out of a box twit. You know, Roger said that, that he felt you were about the best uh, writer, fighter around. <laughs> what do you well, uh, Jim Jones might be. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Tom. What, do you, what do you think about, about the relationship between writing and fighting? I know you have some definite ideas about that. I think they're both arts. I think they're, they're extraordinarily different as arts, really. The, the, the big thing about uh, boxing, after all, is that it's an art of all the arts. Is, 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 I suppose it's the art which makes the greatest demand upon punishment. In other words, as you practice your art, you're being punished for it. So you have to have a vocation, which is probably deeper than the vocation it takes to be a writer. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
No, he always make comparison of a writer and a, and a, and a fighter. And was, he, he's always, he, he always compare uh, to write, like for example, in, in his last book, An American Dream, he says that he was a little bit out of shape, even though it was a good book. Uh, he always liked to write great books, you know. And even though he considered this book a very good book, he says that at the end he was in like a little toy, you know, and at the end of the 15 rounds. I think you have to have a great deal of character to be a, uh, a good novelist. You don't have to be necessarily a nice man, you'd be an evil man. But what you have to, in that case, you have to have an evil character which is filled with dimension. But anyway, I think you have to have a lot of character because uh, opposite demands are made on you as a writer. I mean, on the one hand, you have to be spontaneous. On the other hand, you have to be uh, capable of uh, doing the same thing day after day for years if you're a novelist. You, you see, uh, you've got to be uh, 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 rich in sympathy, and yet at the same time, you have to have an absolute sense of execution so that you cease to follow the fortunes of certain characters in order to follow the fortunes of other characters, so forth and so on. I think fighters also uh, have uh, great demands made upon them for opposites. Like, uh, after boxing, I think I would take writing. And Norman has been like an inspiration, you know, to me. And the, I, he changed me a little bit, you know, the way of thinking. We, when I was training for the championship fight, he came and we boxed a couple of rounds. He got excited. He got tired. <laughs> <laughs> he got tired. Yeah. So how, how is he as a, as a boxer? I like his left hook. He's got, he, got he has fast hands. A really good fighter has got to be uh, quite intelligent. On the one hand, on the other hand, he's got to be willing to uh, lose that intelligence. It, it, you might say that, uh, after man, no matter how good he is after he's been fighting for about 10 years, the odds are that he will have, his brain will be damaged to some small degree. So there's something sacrificial about it as an art. On the other hand, you've got a man, also you've got, what, what you also got, I think the greatest opposite in the life of a fighter is that he's got to be a man of, uh, obviously, of, of, of strength and grace, and uh, a man who uh, lives to a certain extent for the joys of the body, yet his existence is virtually a, a monastic existence. And so he's got to deny the body. And, it, uh, and, and it's this, these abilities to contain opposites within oneself that uh, uh, make for uh, 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 the, the art of prize fighting and the difficulty. The reason why, I mean, th there's a reason why there's so many good street fighters and so few uh, prize fighters. How, how does a writer train? How does a writer train? That's a good question. <laughs> By, uh, I, don't, I don't know. We don't have to skip that question. And the one night, in his house, he had a friend there, and uh, they were having some drinks. And one of the friends called me some names, you know, and he was touching my face. And Norman got mad and hit the guy. And the guy, the guy hit Norman back. So I stepped in between, you know, I got excited. Because I figured that, that maybe the other guy was too strong for Norman. And Norman says, no, the guy is OK. And so he hit him again. And the guy says, oh, Norman, I love you. I can't fight with you. And he left, you know. And that was that was another time that I'm, I'm, a, I'm the fighter, and he was uh, helping me out, you know, Norman, <laughs> backing me up with, with his fist. The, the, the pleasure and the sorrow of prize fighting is you know immediately whether you've won or lost, whereas in, uh, in writing you may not know for a hundred years. <laughs> you know, if you're any good at all, you, uh, you write with some idea of lasting, and that you're not going to know the answer to. You, you know, you, you, uh, your work may be completed day, completely dated ten years after you're dead, or it may last for a century, you just don't know.